Hello everyone, good morning from Toronto, Canada, and good afternoon and good evening to all those who are joining us from across different time zones. Welcome to our webinar on Interfaith Perspectives on Nuclear Weapons, a multi-generational conversation organized by the Next Generation Task Force of the Parliament of the World's Religions. My name is Gehkesha Basu. I am the founder president of Green Hope Foundation and a member of the Next Generation Task Force. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome our amazing panelists and our audience on Zoom and Facebook Live. Now, 75 long years have elapsed since the horrific nuclear assault on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that in fact was an assault on humanity and despite the immense suffering it caused, our world has refused to shun these weapons of mass destruction and has instead gone the opposite way, creating a multitude of weapons whose destructive power defies belief. And the nuclear club of nations uses fear and security threats to justify the continued investments into building and maintaining nuclear stockpiles and espouse the theory of deterrence being the pathway to peace. Nothing can be further from the truth. With the global population bounding towards 8 billion, there is an increasing strain on our planet's finite resources and the opportunity divide keeps on widening, causing immense stress amongst nations and in our societies. And there is this new rise of nationalism that is also being manipulated by the nuclear armed nations to link their arsenals to national pride. So to ride over this rising divisiveness, it is therefore critical to imbibe the principles of multilateralism, to be collaborative, to bring together different perspectives of faith, belief, and culture is well as generations so that we can find solutions through the celebration of our rich diversity. Today's webinar therefore has tremendous relevance as we bring together a multi-generational panel of speakers in remembrance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and to discuss the pathways of peace and unity from interfaith perspectives so that we can mitigate and obviate the nuclear weapons threat permanently. So today it is my privilege to welcome our panelists who will share their work and perspectives on the critical issue of nuclear disarmament. Before we continue, I would like to inform our audience that you can post your questions in the Q&A box if you're on Zoom or in the comments section if you're following us on Facebook Live. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome our first panelist, Madam Audrey Kiragawa, Chair of the Parliament of the World's Religions. Madam Kiragawa, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Kekashan, and hello everyone. I wish to convey my expressions of appreciation for this opportunity to share on this panel on the interfaith perspectives on nuclear weapons, a multi-generational conversation sponsored by the Parliament of the World's Religions Next Gen Task Force. What this panel is modeling is an important paradigm of engagement, not only between communities of faith, but the incorporation of an important issue, nuclear weapons and their abolition, and the presence of elders to not only shepherd, but to stand in solidarity with the younger generation toward the mobilization against the largest existential threat to our existence of all of life on earth. We must learn how to cultivate this multi-generational approach because the next generation must learn about our own failures and the changes that must be made in our infrastructures, mindsets and institutions of dominance and power over the power of love compassion and kindness, especially where, as here, our technologies have far outstripped our ethical principles and values to moderate the development of such destructive and indiscriminate weapons of war. 
we must have a return to our values and ethics first in order to move from that place of transcendence where all sacred scriptures and texts arise and become expressions of the great universal spiritual laws of love, peace, and harmony amongst ourselves and all life forms. We arise from the sacred and the sacredness of life itself must be front and center in all of our actions. The Parliament of the World's Religions is one of the largest interfaith organizations, and it helped to launch the global interfaith movement with its inaugural convening in Chicago in 1893. The Parliament's stand on the abolition of nuclear weapons was crystallized in its passionate call responding to the unique challenge of nuclear weapons in November 2018. During our Toronto 2018 International Convening, we featured several nuclear weapons abolition panels that included Kekashan, Bishop Swing, myself, and other nuclear weapons abolition proponents. This call was a passionate plea to the leaders of all religions all people of goodwill, and all leaders of nations, both with and without nuclear weapons, to commit to work to eliminate these horrific devices forever. It was a call to the nine nuclear weapon countries to promptly commence negotiations to obtain legal instruments leading to the elimination of all nuclear weapons. On August 6th and 9th, of this year, we had a wonderful commemoration of, hold on, here it is. Okay, thank you so much. This is the Hiroshima Nagasaki Accord, which I will be addressing at this time. And to honor this commemoration of the parliament, we joined with three other large interfaith organizations, the United Religions Initiative, of which Bishop Swing is its founder and president, Religions for Peace and the Charter for Compassion. Together, these four interfaith organizations created two things of welcome accomplishment. One was the creation of this Hiroshima Nagasaki Accord, which is shown on your screen. This accord has nine action items that encourages a broad spectrum of civil society sectors to become engaged in the nuclear weapons abolition movement. For example, the youth are encouraged to demand urgent governmental action before these weapons rob them and their children of their future. The second thing that we accomplish was the creation of a historic commemorative film that included former President Mikhail Gorbachev of the USSR, and George Shultz, the former US Secretary of State, and the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those uh, pic pictures are shown now on your screen. And nuclear experts and the leaders of the four co-sponsoring interfaith organizations. While the political leaders at the time saw the promised land of a nuclear weapons-free world, they could not reach the promised land. And President Gorbachev, and Secretary of State George Shultz were principals in that convening of a summit in Iceland. It is our fervent hope that with participation of communities of faith, of which 80% of the world's population are believers in some faith tradition, we will be able to reach the promised land when we stand together on our spiritual, ethical, and moral ground which is what religions and faith traditions do, to work toward the abolition of nuclear weapons. I'd like to show a short trailer of the film and encourage all of our listeners to see the film in its entirety. If you go to the website of the Parliament of the World's Religions or any of the three other co-sponsoring interfaith organizations whose logos are indicated at the top of this flyer, you will be able to see the entirety of the film. So if we could show that trailer, please, Miriam.
it was the only thing left that belonged to my sister. My mother must have been looked after it carefully because she didn't have my sister ashes. When I saw it, I was so shocked. I felt pain and regret. Stronger. Кто-то до сих пор все думают о том, что это вот сдерживание, сдерживание ядерного оружия, значит, то есть позитивная роль ядерного оружия в этом. Я должен сказать, это, это несерьезно, по большому счету, когда речь идет, что же делать с ядерным оружием. Надо от него избавляться, вот что надо делать. 核兵器もまた地球全体から安全と安心を長時間にわたり奪う存在です。Nuclear weapons are so much more than items for national security. They are an affront to the sacredness of all life on this planet. Our ethical, spiritual values and principles that comprise the foundation from which all religions and sacred texts arise is the catalyst that will propel us there. But we must know that that catalyst is powered by love. So thank you so much for showing that trailer. And more and more, we will find that communities of faith are being included in all levels of peace and development work as our leading guiding institutions, such as the United Nations and its agencies and departments that have come to see the benefit of implementing programs on the ground in which communities of faith have pre that have a pre-existing uh, infrastructures and outreach on the ground, that they are very beneficial to implementing programs that are meant to be unfolded on the ground. Therefore, the importance of interfaith organizations and interfaith leaders cannot be underestimated, and they are in fact being increasingly seen as indispensable partners to the creation of peace processes and peaceful outcomes. In order to create global transformation, we must address the duties and responsibilities of each individual who is a member of a family, of society and community and the world to create inner transformation. Whatever is going on in the external world, is a reflection of the collective consciousness of the individuals within it. Therefore, it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to develop our own codes of conduct and being that are in alignment with the important spiritual and ethical values, which informs all sacred texts and teachings. Ultimately, the development of the inner heart to love and care about others, and to be that expression of kindness in action becomes the legacy of our lives. We must know not to harm anyone in our thoughts, words, or deeds, and this rigorous internal spiritual discipline and daily practice creates the essence of our being as peacemakers, peace builders, and peace itself. I wish everyone on this panel and all of our listeners and our brothers and sisters all over the world, peace, peace, peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Kiragawa. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing with us 
the Hiroshima Nagasaki Accord and the film trailer. And uh, you're absolutely right. We do need a multi-generational perspective. We need our elders to share uh, your, the wisdom with us so that we can rectify the mistakes of the past and continue our quest to achieve world peace. And also for highlighting the importance of interfaith leaders and organizations and the importance of creating that inner transformation and thereby world uh, peace. So thank you once again. I shall now invite our next speaker, uh, Mr. Christopher Zefting, Program Officer for Network Development and Coordination at Religions for Peace. Christopher, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you, Madam Kitagawa, for your introductory remarks. They're always so moving and difficult to follow. So um, allow me to thank everybody um, who invited me to be here today. Thank you all for having me. As you mentioned, my name is Christopher Zefting, Program Officer with Religions for Peace International. I also help to coordinate our Global Interfaith Youth Network. Religions for Peace has a long history of engagement with the issue of nuclear disarmament. Through the remarkable work of our senior religious leaders that comprise the Religions for Peace World Council, to the partnerships with our brothers and sisters at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament and the United Nations, and through the production of toolkits and resources for religious communities, including the Guide to Action for Nuclear Disarmament and RFP's Joint Nuclear Ban Treaty Negotiation Handbook. Religions for Peace also has a long history of engaging youth on this particular issue. In 2009, RFP launched the Arms Down Campaign, an appeal led by religious youth calling for one, the complete ban of nuclear weapons, two, the reduction of the global military budget by 10%, and three, the use of this funding to support the achievement of the UN Millennium Development Goals at that time. Within one year, this campaign had secured over 20 million endorsements from people of faith and goodwill all around the world. Included among these signatories were the mayors of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And on the 4th of October, 2010, the interfaith youth leaders delivered this petition to the United Nations Secretary General's High Representative for Disarmament. In this same spirit, Religions for Peace continues to engage youth leaders. What was planned as a commemorative Religions for Peace 50th anniversary on the occasion of the 32nd Olympiad and in recognition of the 75th anniversary of the first atomic bombing and 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, Religions for Peace had sought to convene youth leaders of distinct religious and regional backgrounds in Kyoto, Hiroshima, and Tokyo, Japan. Obviously, coronavirus had other plans for my fellow young people, um, but these efforts are still planned for 2021 when RFP youth leadership body will travel to Japan to strengthen multi-religious youth action and to uphold the spirit of the Olympic truce. This truce is a tradition as old as the Olympic games themselves, first proclaimed in the inaugural games in 776 BC and revived in the early 1990s with the support of the United Nations. The Olympic truce seeks to end global conflict by calling for quote, peace, dialogue and reconciliation in areas of conflict during and beyond the Olympic games period. While, not, while we may not have been thrilled this year by the sportsmanship of the Olympics, as the threat of coronavirus continues to rock communities around the world, Religions for Peace youth nonetheless recognize the crucial need for the spirit of this truce. In May of this year, the International Youth Committee of Religions for Peace issued an interfaith youth call for the global ceasefire during COVID-19 crisis. In it, they made the following appeal to governmental leaders. We urge you to reallocate a portion of your military budget to your healthcare budget instead. Instead of purchasing more weapons, purchase medical supplies, personal protective equipment, testing kits and medications. Instead of spending on warfare, dedicate the funds to support the vulnerable, including refugees, migrants, and internally displaced persons to ensure their access to testing, treatment, clean water, and hygiene supplies. Instead of finding means to end lives, let us work together to save lives. I am here today in service of and glowing with pride for these young leaders as they continue to call for the cessation of hostilities, the laying down of arms and the total abolition of nuclear weapons. I would also like to take a moment in recognition of the 75th, 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki commemorative video presentation. 
This moving piece, which features some truly diverse and meaningful perspective, walks us through the painful history of nuclear detonation, the adverse effects these weapons have on all peoples of the world, and the historic and ongoing ventures to see an end to the existence of nuclear weapons. In that film, President Gorbachev states, fighting for the abolition of nuclear weapons is the civic duty of each and every one of us. What's more, our Secretary General at Religions for Peace, Professor Dr. Aza Karam, speaks to the, quote, moral obligation to continue to raise this message. There can be no peace where there is nuclear threat. It is as simple as that. And I truly believe it is as simple as that. Don't get me wrong, the struggle to ensure the abolition of nuclear weapons continues every day. And there is nothing simple about the complex intergovernmental and national mechanisms that need to be installed in order to ensure this end. But the deeply felt moral conviction is one that arises easily. It is a simple conclusion to draw that my conscience and the convictions of my faith leave no wiggle room for murder, least so on a planetary scale. My fellow young people have never felt the shock wave that rippled around the world, but we have watched the devastation of unending wars, which the very presence of nuclear weapons perpetuates. We have witnessed the ongoing desecration of the lands and lives of indigenous people, both of which have been abused in the process of testing nuclear weapons. We have striven to cultivate a sustainable relationship with our environment, one that is irreparably damaged with every nuclear detonation. And we have literally watched ourselves age as individuals and institutions drag their feet, dig in their heels and defend the status quo of nuclear threat that began in an era of my father's father's father. I recently celebrated the birth of my nephew, my sister's son, who now too lives in a world under nuclear threat. It is my sincere hope and the reason I am here today that his might be the last generation to live under the threat of nuclear weapons. I would like to offer my congratulations to Kekishan for the, uh, being awarded the Voices uh, Youth Award this year. And I would like to finally conclude by thanking all the organizers and the host who brought us here together today for this critical conversation. I'm usually on the other side of these webinars, so I really do appreciate all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. Thank you very much from myself, all of the youth, and from Religions for Peace. Thank you, Christopher, for sharing the work of Religions for Peace on nuclear disarmament with us. I think a positive is that young people are continuing their advocacy even during this pandemic, as evidenced by this webinar. And you're right, we, the youth, play a huge role to move away from words to actions. So thank you for sharing your comments with us. Our next speaker is Ms. Anna Ikeda, from the Office of UN Affairs of Sohagakai International. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I also really want to thank the co-organizers for the invitation today. As mentioned, my name is Anna Ikeda, and I'm with the Sohagakai International, a global network of Buddhists, and I work for their Office for UN Affairs. Um, it's my pleasure to join today's panel and speak about this critical issue of nuclear weapons, especially on this important occasion of the 75th anniversary from a faith perspective. Um, personally, this is made very meaningful as one of the main reasons I started working for nuclear weapons abolition is my Buddhist faith. One of the things I really enjoy about working for disarmament is that you get to work with a group of talented and dedicated individuals from all sorts of backgrounds. You engage with diplomats, people from a wide range of NGOs and civil society, um, academics, students, what have you. Um, and of course, the global hibakusha and the people from the affected communities. The list goes on uh, and they all bring in unique contributions. But the more I engage in this work, the stronger I feel about the important roles that we, the communities of faith, can and must play as one of the stakeholders to create a world free from nuclear weapons. And I really found myself nodding vigorously to the previous presenters because I think we share the same conviction. Um, I've had the honor of working with many dedicated individuals from various faith traditions through our work at the UN and beyond who have demonstrated to me that our 
different faith traditions have so much in common and that we all share the goal of a peaceful and just world. So for this webinar, we were provided by Kakashan uh, with four questions to address. They were on the importance of multi-generational approach to nuclear abolition, uh, about our organization's work, uh, in my case, it's the SGI, um, the role of interfaith organizations and leaders, and the importance of transforming our culture. Um, I decided to address them in a sort of this uh, integrated way, rather than speaking on them separately as they are all interrelated. And I'll center my talk on the role of faith communities in nuclear weapons abolition based on my own experience. Um, so what contributions do people of faith play in this quest for nuclear disarmament and abolition? Well, there are many, but one way to think about it is that um, there's this sort of dilemma that while on one hand, um, you know, this issue of nuclear weapons affect everyone, and I really mean everyone in the world, right? Um, but also, I believe that often there is this uh, perception that it is something so far removed from people's reality and day, day to day life. Um, and this means that many people may lack just the awareness that it is an issue that we must address with urgency. Or even if they know about it, they may feel like it is something beyond their influence and that they cannot really make a difference. And I believe this is true, especially for young people. And uh, this is where I feel the communities of faith like ours play a vital role to bridge the gap and help people see that connection. Speaking from my own experience, years ago, I was serving as a national coordinator of university students uh, practicing Buddhism with the SGI here in the United States. And we were tasked to create and spearhead a campaign to engage university students in nuclear abolition. To be honest, it was the very first time I really thought about and engaged with the issue. Although I'm from Japan and knew about the history and devastations caused by the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What helped me develop the connection and later on passion was my Buddhist faith, as I mentioned earlier. From a Buddhist perspective, we view nuclear weapons as an absolute evil. They are a complete opposite of our core belief which is the sanctity of all life. At the same time, the Buddhist view of life is all encompassing and comprehensive. It recognizes that while inherently possessing the unlimited potential for good, life also has destructive aspects. Our Buddhist philosophy perceives nuclear weapons as a manifestation of the bleakest aspect of life's inner workings. To characterize this, our second president of the organization, Jose Toda, called out that we must rip out the hidden claw that hides within such weapons in his passionate declaration calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons in 1957. This declaration has served as the foundation and cornerstone of our organization's peace and disarmament activities to date. Building on this point, our current and international president Daisaku Ikeda states, and I quote, the real enemy that we must confront is the ways of thinking that justify nuclear weapons, the readiness to annihilate others when they are seen as a threat or as a hindrance to the realization of our objectives. So I believe that when we talk about the issue of nuclear weapons at such a fundamental level of life or ways of thinking, rather than thinking about it as say, solely as this mechanical object or in terms of national security policy, I believe we can help people see that connection with the issue and empower them to engage. Personally, it has helped me to always remember, and I think uh, somebody else mentioned this already, that the dark functions of life that manifest as nuclear weapons and war also are inside my life. And therefore, while I fight against them externally, I must continue to engage in my inner work. And during my days of engaging with the university students among our faith community, we talked about it as the atomic bomb in our hearts. And I'd imagine other faith communities too have similar ways to talk about the issue by connecting it with the core principles and ideas within their traditions. Um, to translate this belief into action, my organization, SGI, has been conducting many activities on nuclear disarmament. At our office, for example, 
My colleagues and I support the work of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons to ensure the early entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We also attend major disarmament conferences at the UN to bring the voices of our membership to the discussion. We've also worked with other faith groups working at the UN to issue joint interfaith statements on nuclear disarmament since 2014. This year, uh, we helped coordinate a statement on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it was supported by 189 organizations. I'll talk about this statement toward the end. Um, and we were also very happy to be an endorser of the Hiroshima Nagasaki Accord, which was mentioned earlier, uh, coordinated by the co-sponsors of this webinar. So thank you so much for your efforts as well. Um, at the grassroots level, SGI's activities are focused on non-formal education to raise awareness about the issue among the public and inspire action. We focus on education because we believe that ultimately, the most fundamental and surest way to peace and disarmament hinges upon transforming people's hearts and minds so that the humanity can coexist and thrive together. And this is where, as faith organizations, we can play a critical role. There's a Buddhist concept called the 3000 realms in a single moment of life, which teaches that there exists in each of us an unlimited power over capacity. This means a change in the deepest levels of an individual's consciousness and commitment can give rise to powerful transformation in one's surroundings and society, even for the entire world to change. So fundamentally, our educational activities aim to cultivate that creative human capacity to change our circumstances. As an example of our educational activities, in 2007, we launched an initiative called People's Decade for Nuclear Abolition, which offered a framework to encourage local initiatives and actions, often led by young people, to create spaces where people can learn about the issue and exchange their perspectives. Activities included exhibition tours, workshops, symposium, petition drives, and youth awareness surveys. In Japan, we have held opportunities where young people can listen to the testimonies of the Hibakusha directly, and that has always been impactful. One of the participants uh, several years ago in such an event said that um, there is nothing more powerful than listening to the testimonies of Hibakusha because it steers your emotions and heart. Facts do not move your heart. And without that, you would not be driven to take action. Uh, what we also find that this relates to, uh, and this relates to today's theme of the multi-generational conversation, uh, is that involving youth has energized older generations, particularly the Hibakusha. So for example, one Hiroshima survivor recalled that in 2012, he attended a nuclear disarmament event with the Sokogaka youth, where his friend was the speaker. And uh, he said, it was inspiring to meet many young people at the event. I reflected how, despite being a survivor myself, have not taken any action toward peace till then. And that's how he himself started to speak up against nuclear weapons. Because nuclear weapons affect everyone, we need to involve everyone to create solutions, people from every generation. Personally, as someone still relatively new to the field, I am moved and inspired by the stories of activists and survivors who have been working on this issue for decades. It is thanks to their continuous work over the course of many years that we are able to keep moving forward. And yet, we need to keep inspiring younger generations as this is a multi-generational issue. And at times, progress can be very slow. From my experience, engaging young people in this issue can be challenging, especially for a long ter longer term. Young people have shifting priorities, many changes in their life, and it does not help that professional opportunities in this field are rather limited. I believe that, again, this is an area faith communities can contribute, as when people engage in this issue as a result of being driven by their faith, like myself, that would be one powerful reason they would be committed. In the SGI, too, our activities for nuclear disarmament are often led by young, young people. I also want to note that the second Sokogakai president Toda made his declaration for nuclear abolition in 1957, 
in front of 50,000 youth in Japan. And he said that this was one of his final instructions in life. To conclude, I'd like to read an opening paragraph of the interfaith statement this year I mentioned earlier. As a wide coalition of faith-based communities from around the world, we have committed to speaking with one voice that rejects the existential threat to humanity that nuclear weapons pose. We reaffirm that the presence of even one nuclear weapon violates the core principles of our different faith traditions and threatens the unimaginable destruction of everything we hold dear. Nuclear weapons are not only a future risk, their presence here and now undermines the ethical and moral foundations of the common good. We call for your commitment to a world that is more peaceful, safe, and just, a world only possible with the elimination of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Anna, for sharing your personal experiences as well as the work of Soha Gakai International. And you highlighted the importance of education and how that is the best way forward to make people aware and how it's especially relevant for young people. So thank you for emphasizing the critical role of faith and interfaith organizations and educating and bringing together people and youth in this nuclear disarmament movement recognizing the absolute evil of nuclear weapons. Thank you once again. I would now like to invite our next speaker, the Right Reverend William Swing, President and Founding Trustee of the United Religions Initiative. Bishop Swing, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's quite an honor to be on with you all. Uh, we're uh, at the United Religions Initiative. We come to all of this uh, late and you all have been at it for a long time and have done a great job and are doing a great job. I'd, I'd like to talk just a little bit about interfaith and then faith. Um, in, in, in this uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki 75th uh, video, what I learned was that um, if interfaith and faith organizations can work together, you can do more than one can do by oneself. Um, uh, that was demonstra de demonstratively uh, proven. And uh, not only can you do more, but you begin to have an appreciation of each other. And that's what a, a interfaith is all about having appreciation of, of the other and learning to work together. Uh, secondly, one of the things that are, is unique about us is that uh, every time we get together, we have the same prayer. It's called a nuclear prayer. We also have a child's nuclear prayer. And I'd like to, Chris uh, was talking about having a new baby in his family. Uh, here's a child's nuclear prayer, thinking about that child. In St. Petersburg, Russia, a little girl kneels by her bed at night to say a prayer. In St. Petersburg, Florida, a little boy kneels by his bed to say a prayer. They use the same words. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. What could possibly cause the death of a Russian child an American child at night as they sleep. The answer hovers over their head in the dark, swirling around the world and aimed at them. Nuclear weapons. The children will never see the weapons. The warheads are hiding in submarines underwater. Some are underground and unapproachable but they are real, practically invisible, but they are part of a secret and dark universe that has, be, has been created to destroy the world, if need be, in the name of national security. All this is almost unimaginable. Nevertheless, imagine. 27,000 miles in space, there's a little satellite, which is a nuclear launch tower in the sky. 
Imagine a nuclear torpedo designed to create a tsunami wave almost a mile high that would contaminate an enemy's coastline in wide stretches with radioactivity. Imagine the President of the United States having minutes to decide whether to obliterate life as we've known it on this planet and then flying off in an airplane called Doomsday. Imagine a missile called Satan II carrying the most warheads ever assembled on a miss missile and it is aimed at America. Imagine only 15 minutes for submarines to release 400 nuclear warheads and hit their targets in Russia and other places. Imagine a general flying around in an aircraft called the Looking Glass armed with a nuclear bomb. All this is reality. All this is true. It is all so childish and also evil beyond any scale of morality. Someday it is possible we will blow up the last child on earth. We have planned to do that. Perhaps the last girl will live in St. Petersburg, Russia, and the last boy will live in St. Petersburg, Florida. But then again, Maybe two St. Petersburg children today will wake up praying instead of going to sleep praying, and their nuclear prayer will be this. Now I rise to face the storm and fight for children yet unborn. May I awake before I die and banish bombs and clear the sky. Amen. So that's my offering. Thank you so much, Bishop Swain, for sharing with us the children's nuclear prayer that really uh, lets us know about how horrific a nuclear war would be uh, for all, for humanity and for our planet. So thank you once again. And you also mentioned a very important point that is faith and interfaith organizations together, working together can do so much more. So I thank you once again for your comments and thank you so much panelists for the very enlightening discussion. We shall now take questions from the audience. So I see here that we have questions from both Zoom and Facebook Live. So the first question, it's actually two questions but they're very interconnected. So today is the 75th anniversary of the surrender of Japan for World War II after the US used nuclear weapons. What is your opinion about the moral position of the U.S. that the use of nuclear weapons on civilian Japanese targets ended World War II? Is this question posed to any of the panelists? No, it's just to everyone. Okay. I'll answer that. I think uh, the dropping of the nuclear bomb and the position of the U.S. and many people who believed in the dropping of the bomb and supported it as the methodology by which the war ended, we have to consider these important points. The bombs targeted innocent civilians who became in a big way the victims of war. And the cold coin words now that we use today to call them collateral damage. The question becomes, did the end justify the means? And we also need to ask, why was the bomb dropped on the Japanese by the Americans? Germany and Italy were also considered enemies. And in the US, why were only the Japanese interned in the United States in internment camps? Most of these Japanese sit, were citizens of the U United States. And in a presidential commission in 1982, it was identified racial pre prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership as the underlying causes of the government's internment program. And on August 9th, the day the Nagasaki bomb was dropped, President Truman received a telegram from Samuel McCray Cavert, a Protestant clergyman 
who pleaded with the president to stop the bombing before any further devastation by atomic bomb is visited upon the Japanese people. Two days later, Truman replied to him, the only language they seem to understand is the one we have been using to bombard them. When you have to deal with a beast, you have to treat them as a beast. Here you have the classic dehumanization of a whole race of people to justify killing them en masse because they are no longer human beings. And isn't this exactly what Hitler did to the Jews? Marginalize them, dehumanize them, and therefore make it totally justifiable to kill them because they're no longer human beings. Now, this whole aspect of racism really needs to be examined, especially in contemporary times, because as you know, right now in the US and around the world, we are going through tremendous tumultuous self-examination and protests with respect to this very issue. And we must examine carefully our own biases, prejudices, and the you know, enculturation of our mindsets to allow us to so dehumanize whole races of people that it allows us to exterminate them from the face of the earth. And I would say that under no circumstances should we allow ourselves to be called civilized people, that we can create these weapons of mass destruction that speak to our own ability to create marginalization and dehumanization that perpetuate our own racial prejudices and biases and mindsets. So that's my answer. Thank you so much, Madam Kiregawa. Would any of our other panelists like to answer? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I, I don't think there's um, anything new that's going to come out of re-examining uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've been uh, re-examining that for 75 years. I don't think the issue is what's, what happened 75 years ago. I think the issue is what are we doing right now? Uh, with with the weapons and who is targeted for those weapons today. Uh, I think we get lost in that stuff. And th there's another argument, another argument, another argument, and the ruts of that argu arguing goes, go deep. Uh, I think uh, what we need to do is to, to focus our energy on the threat that's at hand, not the threat that used to be. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Swing. Anna or Christopher, would you like to, have, uh, do you have any comments? Yes, Anna. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much to both of you. I, I thought that was so powerful and so true, I can't agree more. Just wanna add that, you know, but I think also uh, echoing what Bishop Swing has said, this question, uh, you know, shows just how prevalent that narrative and way of thinking is, you know, and I think that's what we are up against, you know, is this common, belief, especially in American society still today, that it was justified. And I think, you know, because of the narrative, people are still skeptical that nuclear disarmament is possible or effective, you know. So I think it's important that we all study the history, but I agree, then what does that mean today so that we can move forward? If I could do a follow-up statement on that, um, Anna had also indicated that the indigenous peoples were also you know, used um, in, 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 a, in a very horrible sense. And there was a very powerful speaker on this film, Leona Morgan, who was an indig indigenous person and indicated that a nuclear bomb was tested on indigenous land in the United States. There was no forewarning, no preparation made to evacuate the First Nations people from the testing site. And they suffered for years from cancers and a, a tremendous grief over the effects of the radiation on their land and on the people. So when you consider how our own history has been towards the treatment of First Nations people, not only in the US, but all around the world with the Aborigines and you know, the indigenous peoples everywhere. Again, it goes to this primary issue that we cannot 
successfully do an examination of the present without having a very close and meticulous study of our own my mindsets, biases, and prejudices, and enculturation of that kind of mindset that allows us to create this whole dehumanization of whole races of people to support and justify our own ends. So this is a very much deeper, deeper issue that I am talking about. And to the extent we do not address and turn that searchlight inward to examine our own selves and our own biases and prejudices, this kind of mindset will continue to mobilize our future action, our present and future action to uh, you know, dehumanize people and say that it is perfectly all right because they're no longer human beings that we can exterminate them en masse. So it is really a deeper issue that I am talking about here that has even brought us to the state to create and deploy weapons of mass destruction. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Kitagawa. I would just like to add that nuclear colonialism, as you said, is such a big problem all around the world. In my country, in Canada, the uh, atomic bombs killed uh, thousands of people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but the uranium that went into making fat boy and little, uh, fat, fat man and little boy came from uh, the Diné community of the Great Bear Lake in Canada and the indigenous people were, weren't even informed that the, what they were carrying from mine to the mill was radioactive, which caused them to die from cancer. So I completely agree that it's a much deeper issue that we need uh, to address. And we really need a mindset change in order to be aware of all of these problems that surround uh, nuclear weapons and thereby nuclear disarmament. We have time for one more question. So I see that uh, there is a question from Max Lau, who is studying at the Soho University in America and wants to know what uh, he can do to start promoting nuclear weapons abolishment and uh, would like to know more about uh, his progress in education on this topic and what kind of education and progress can be used to start uh, the activism on nuclear disarmament. So once again, this question is to all the panelists. We had had a few questions come in that invite, you know, that asked how can I get involved within my own community? Um, and I actually invited some of our audience members today to watch the film that has been brought up several times. Not only is it, is it incredibly insightful, um, it gives some direct guidance on how we can engage our own communities how we can um, both look internally within ourselves to kind of uproot the causes of, of human violence at the same time that we engage our faith communities and our loved ones, and how to take more of an activist approach um, when it comes to our governmental leaders, um, intergovernmental actors such as the United Nations. I think that there is a, a multitude of places that we can begin to look. Um, Anna obviously brought up the importance of education. And I just want to quickly tie in some of the relationships between um, the ethnically or racially motivated uses of nuclear weapons and the ties to the rise of nationalism and this kind of false patriotism that arises with the possession of nuclear weapons. I do not believe that these are distinct phenomena. I think they are mutually supporting each other and, and building each other up. And really the only way that I see to completely unroot that prejudice is through education. Thank you so much, Christopher. Would, yes, Bishop Swain? Uh, I, each one of us has um, a Facebook website. Uh, you, could, you could look up our website, our Facebook, and there would be an invitation for you to join. Uh, in our case, uh, Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, and others have other ways of joining. There, there are lots of ways out there. Just look for Religions for Peace, Soko Kai, uh, uh, Parliament, um, whatever. There, there are plenty of avenues with doors open. Thank you so much, Bishop Swain, for sharing that with us. Absolutely. Uh, Madam Kitagawa or Anna, would you like to say something? Yes, Anna. 
Yes, uh, yeah, I can agree uh, more. There are multiple resources already available and they are all excellent. So please, you know, I think whatever you find useful, um, there's probably something out there. Uh, but also I, I always like to say, especially to youth, uh, that there's no action that's too small or too trivial. I think anything each one of us can do can have so much impact, sometimes even beyond what we can imagine. And I think if it comes from your passion, your desire for the world, you know, that's free and peaceful and just, you know, if it's uh, in alignment with your interest, uh, if it's from your heart, then I think it will really touch other people around you. And uh, I think that's really how we can reach so many people. There's no cookie cutter approach to this issue because I feel like sometimes I'm preaching to the choir, you know, people who are already interested and kind of bought into this idea of nuclear evolution. So the question is, how do we reach beyond that wire, right? And how do we reach the people who still believe that nuclear weapons usage was justified or that we need nuclear weapons to maintain so-called peace today? So uh, I think each of our creativity is welcome and necessary. And I think uh, also echoing what Christopher said, uh, there are ways that we can also be intersectional and also be able to address so many different issues because they are all connected. There's a you know, there's a place where nuclear weapons and climate activism can march. There's, you know, racism and nuclear weapons, like it was already discussed. There are so many other issues that we can all uh, talk about in connections to nuclear weapons. We really have to support each other's activism and movement. And I think there's, the, there's so much room for creativity there as well. So I just wanted to comment that. Yeah, really, we must strip ourselves of the belief that nuclear weapons give us Re a real sense of peace and security. The exact opposite is true. We have never been less peaceful and more insecure than at any time in our history because of the increasing uh, lethality factors of our technologies. And I go back to my point again, that our, these technologies have outstripped our ethical, moral, and values and principles which we must return to in order to change our mindsets, our enculturation, so that we understand what it truly means to be fully human and to move from the heart of love and compassion and caring for each other. And to always remember the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated. And life is sacred and in no uh, way, shape or form must we ever violate the sacredness of life itself. Absolutely, thank you so much, Madam Kiradawa. I would now give the floor to Miriam, to, uh, who will talk to us about the Next Generation Task Force. Miriam, you have the floor. Thank you, Kekashan, and thank you for the amazing work that you've done moderating the panel, and to all our panelists, thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of the Next Generation Task Force, and I'll be brief because we're we're cutting it short here, but um, I wanna thank the panelists and all our attendees for joining this amazing multi-generational conversation on the issues affecting all our communities and all our uh, nations and all our generations that are happening in the world. Um, this webinar marks the first in a series that we'll be launching as part of the Next Generation Programming at the Parliament of the World's Religions. So we invite you to save the date on the 15th of every month um, the Next Generation Task Force will be gathering experts from around the world on multi-generational discussions um, on issues facing all our communities around the world. So we invite you to stay connected. You can visit us at parliamentofreligions.org. You can follow us on Facebook and YouTube at Parliament of Religions or Twitter and Instagram at Interfaith World. And we will be creating an overview of this discussion and we'll be sure to share um, links and references to all our panelists and their organizations and any resources that they have available on this issue so that you can um, expand your experience from this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. And I would like to thank all of uh, our panelists for your profound views. Nuclear weapons pose the greatest threat to all forms of life on our planet and the risks of a mishap are too critical to ignore. And clearly there needs to be a larger cross-section of voices involved in the call for disarmament as was echoed in today's discussion. 
and young people have a defining role to play in shaping current and future policy. But for that, we need education because that is the key, not waiting for someone else to tell us the answer. And dialogue, collaboration, and multilateralism are the need of the hour, and we must continue to bring new thoughts and perspectives to uh, keep this issue at the forefront of the national and international agenda so that sooner rather than later, we can permanently create a nuclear-free world. Thank you once again, and we look forward to meeting you at our next webinar. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.